Icon AU education uh, session and uh, Stephen here has the enviable position of being the last session before the afternoon break. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're going to give him all of our focus. Uh, Stephen is a senior lecturer at the University of Sydney in the field of statistics, data science and machine learning and teaches Python in all of those. And what I found exciting is that he also has a bit of a penchant for uh, microcontrollers and has a fully automated greenhouse in his backyard. So we're going to be talking later. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming to probably the most boring titled presentation of PyCon, um, Assurance of Learning Through Testing. I'm presenting this on behalf of work from both myself and Alison, who you saw earlier. Um, and this is work that we have sort of developed over a number of years. It's not something that we have put together just for PyCon. This is something that has been an ongoing project for us. And in this talk, I'm going to go over uh, um, the problems we're facing uh, and some suggestions about how we've solved them, and hopefully they're helpful for you in the future. So first of all, I want to talk about or cover off what is uh, assurance of learning. Um, the key thing that we're trying to get across with assurance of learning is that we need to make sure that students are actually learning what we want them to learn. Um, or in other cases, we want them to achieve the learning outcomes that we set. So for our units, uh, in, our, in our context at the University of Sydney, we set learning outcomes for our units. So these are the things we want our students to achieve by the end, uh, and we want to make sure that they do that. And you could take that further and say that there are learning outcomes at each week, uh, subtopics that you want them to learn as well. So we want to demonstrate this through assessment, uh, and it's not just for the sort of promise that we give to the students through those learning outcomes, uh, and what we want to give as educators, but we actually at the university have some requirements that we uh, assure that we do this. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is mostly in the context of using EdSTEM, but tools like Repolit and GitHub, um, through Renee's talk you would have seen earlier, actually have the facility to do this sort of testing um, of your student's code. Um, so keep in mind that even though I'm going to give examples that show screenshots of Ed, um, this is quite general. Um, so don't think that you have to use Ed to, uh, to do this. And here's an example of one of the exercises that we might actually give our students to do, uh, the description of one of them anyway. So we might get them to write a simple code, a uh, Python program to um, read in a number from the user, so collect some user input, and then tell the user whether that was a big number or not. So this is a very simple exercise we might give our students in week one or week two of an intro programming class. Um, and the students will get this exercise description, and then they'll write some code. The code might look something like this. I've intentionally put a bug in there. Hopefully, you can spot it um, for that exercise. Um, and then they'll go ahead and submit it. Um, so after they've submitted it, they'll get some feedback from a number of test cases that we've written ourselves. So in this example, there are four test cases shown. We have the, they're just based on the number that we input into the uh, program to test whether the student passed or not. So in this case, the student didn't pass the 107 test case because they actually put out uh, or printed out on the console a, that's a big number when they shouldn't have. Um, and in this uh, example, through this talk, we're going to go through the problems of this sort of environment of uh, making sure that students are doing what we actually want them to be doing and learning what, what we want them to learn uh, through this uh, automatic, automatic testing environment. And just as a little bit of context for behind the scenes, this is what one of those diff-based tests would look like on Ed's back end. We tell Ed, um, this is the name of the test case. On the left-hand side, this is the sort of the uh, parameters or configuration. Uh, and then we tell it what's the expected input for the program, what's the expected output for the program. And then above, I have some examples of what those input and output files look like, uh, creatively named in and out. Um, and from here, Ed will do the, all the heavy lifting for us uh, normally of actually producing all that nice, pretty feedback for the student. And this works OK for the... Um, great majority of cases, but there are cases where it's, it falls down. Um, and the cases are really where um, we want to do more complicated testing, like longer programs that are more interactive and dynamic, or where we have students that aren't trying to hack the test cases. So only when it only works when we have compliant students. Um, and so we, by creating this sort of test case setup, uh, and evaluating our students in this way, we've created a sort of a student versus teacher paradigm where we're kind of chasing each other's tails. They're trying to beat us all the time and we're trying to beat them. Um, so here's an example of a devious student's um, solution for that example. They might just uh, hard code in 
the answers for the test cases. So for the other test cases, like 2 on 107, you actually don't need to print any output to pass this test case. So this is not what we want the student to do. We want them to use an if statement and produce a more general program. We don't want them to be hard coding against our test cases. We want them to, sh we want them to demonstrate their general understanding and have the ability to generalize to new problems. Here's another example of a more complicated case where we might want them to do some sort of simulation and then that simulation results in a random output. In this case, this is a Monte Carlo uh, simulation. So they're sort of uh, evaluating an integral, the area under the curve, by actually just generating a random bunch of numbers and, um, or coordinates on the, on the grid and seeing which proportion of those fall underneath the curve. So each time you run it, as shown on the right-hand side, you might get a slightly different result. And our diff-based testing that Ed has provided in the past is not actually going to be suitable for that case um, because we have a fixed input and output. So we can't tolerate different outputs from our student, even though they've got a perfectly valid answer. Um, and here's another example of a longer form program that a student, we might ask a student to build. Um, so they have this console program that is just uh, collecting key value pairs and sort of a data entry program. Um, and in this case, the student has to, has to implement a whole bunch of uh, commands like the add, get, and print commands, and these will also have dynamic outputs based on the previous state on what has been entered into the, the data storage system beforehand. So um, being able to test um, the, that the state of the program is correct and the student's doing what we want using that diff style test is not really uh, very user-friendly to us as teachers because it means that we have to write thousands of tests to make sure that everything actually works. And we want something a little bit more general and flexible that can uh, cut down on the work for us when testing long, complicated programs like this. And there's also other issues that are a little bit more um, Python technical, like if we want students to uh, demonstrate their understanding of some uh, object-oriented programming concepts, we might want them to use like Python's inbuilt inheritance uh, features. Like on the top, we might expect them for their checking class of a bank account to use the super um, method rather than just sort of re-implementing uh, that same code in the child class. Uh, and doing a diff-based test on this is kind of weird. Like, I don't think it's possible. Uh, and again, there are some cases where we want students to do things by hand rather than using an existing library. And doing a diff on that is not going to reveal that to us. So these are some, uh, a devious student might go, oh, this uh, exercise asks us to calculate the average or the mean. So I know NumPy implements that for me, so I will just use NumPy's implementation rather than writing it from scratch. Whereas we want them to write it from scratch to demonstrate their understanding of uh, variables, data types, uh, loops, and so on. So in summary, we want students to solve dynamic, interactive, and interesting programs. Uh, and we want them to be able to demonstrate achievement of learning outcomes, not to take shortcuts and things like that. So, the start of our solution here is to use a Python library called pexpect based on the expect uh, console uh, program if you've used it before. The important thing about pexpect is it allows you to um, programmatically control another script and you can feed it input and read the output as if you were a human typing those commands yourself. So pexpect is um, very powerful and um, you don't actually to be useful, you don't actually have to use the full gamut of what it uh, gives us, but um, we only use a very small number of um, PXPEX features uh, to get our uh, good results. Here's an example of how you might use PXPEX. Um, so you just need to import it, and then the next sort of block of code there is to spawn the, your, um, your student's code, like that big number Python file in a, in a sub-process, a child process. Um, set up the logging so that you can collect the output of that program as it's running, and then send line, you can send input to that program, uh, and then you can expect, so child.expect, the pexpect EOF end of file just means that you're gonna wait until that program ends. So in this case, it's very simple. That big number exercise only re requires uh, us to send one line of text in and then just wait for the program to end. Afterwards, you can collect the output, it's in byte format, and then you can you decode it into something sensible. Uh, so here's a little cheat sheet of things you might want to use uh, or do with pexpect. So spawning a child process, number one thing. Sending lines of text as well. Uh, you can expect 
things that are quite interesting. So you can use regular expressions to wait for output. So you can wait until the program from your student actually matches a regular expression if you want, or if you know that it's not going to be changing, you can expect an exact string as shown at the bottom. So if you wanted to, the student to output hello world, you could um, expect exactly that string. So this gets us onto the pathway of, those, of defeating those earlier problems. So if we want to input a random number into our student's program, like we didn't, we, with those earlier test cases, we only put in four numbers for them to test, and they could then counter that. We can instead feed in a random number from Python's random library, or maybe if you want to use NumPy or something like that, you can do it too. So the first example at the top is showing how to send in a random number. Um, with the, the hard, to defeat hard coding, you probably also want to repeat these tests a few times, not just send in one random number. They might get lucky, so you might want to repeat your tests as well. Uh, here's an example at the bottom of how you could send in some random text. So on most sort of uh, uh, Linux or Unix environments, you, there's a file called words under user shared dict, uh, and then you can just randomly sample from those words and send them in as well if you, if you wanted to send in some random text to your student's program. We've got a duplicate side there. It also allows you to tolerate randomness. So in the example of that Monte Carlo simulation, uh, doing the integration, this is a regular expression that you might use. This is going to give you, allow a student to report a result uh, by printing it out. Uh, that's a, a digit or number up to four decimal places. Um, this is just a, a simple example. You might have something that's tailored more to your needs. Um, and you can help your students a little bit here or restrict the complexity of your regular expressions by saying that, okay, you need to print out the uh, final answer to a specific number of decimal places and so on. So how do you actually do more complicated interaction? This requires a little bit more code. Um, the strategy that, that we've adopted is to have a file, maybe it's called inputs.txt, that lists on each line all the inputs that you're going to send into your student's uh, code. Um, so we can just read that in and split it into the separate lines and then use just a, a quick little loop to uh, send in those new lines. So the first thing we're going to do is just wait, expect a new line. Uh, maybe you, the, the way we tend to structure our, um, or the way I have been uh, structuring the, the programs is to get the student to print something out the first time uh, and then wait for the uh, slash r slash n, which is the new line or end of line character set, uh, and then afterwards at the end, buried at the bottom, is to send in the next line of text. So this way you can just feed in a whole bunch of text and just listen to see what your student has produced at the end. Afterwards you could then, using the, the, um, the example that I gave before, collect all the output and compare it to, um, to see whether it was what you expected. If you wanted to, um, this example, Sorry, this example will just spew in a bunch of text into the student's program and it doesn't care what the student puts back every time. If you cared what the student gave you back every time, then you might have a corresponding outputs file and then sort of go tit for tat with the inputs outputs file in your loop. Um, and maybe if they uh, failed at a certain point, you could stop them early if you want to stop their program early. Okay, so that's the, the relatively straightforward stuff. Um, we do encounter more difficult problems, which I want to talk about now. Uh, and this is the stuff that is a little bit more niche uh, and maybe more applicable to uh, higher levels of uh, education in, in high school, like years 11 and 12, or university onwards. Um, so cases where you have, um, going back to the checking bank account example, um, doing a diff-based test is not going to reveal whether a student has actually implemented the child class constructor properly, um, but you can use Python's uh, unit test library to help with that. So you can patch the parent class constructor, in this case bank account init, and listen to see whether the, the, uh, that was called by the child class. So here's an example of, of doing that. So um, to do the monkey patch, you just use this nice decorator from the unit test mock library. Uh, you supply the name of the uh, function that you want to actually patch uh, and then associate that with a, fu a function. Uh, in this case, it's just called test super. And inside that function, I'm just 
uh, creating a new instance of the child class, and then after it, checking whether the child class was actually called. So mock super assert called, uh, and that refers back to the, um, the name of the function in green. Uh, and then to run this, you just run it as a normal function, like test super. So that way you can get an error if the, if the student hasn't actually called the function that you expected them to call. This doesn't just, isn't just limited to uh, object-oriented programming. You could apply this to almost uh, anything you can think of that is in the form of a function. The next issue is literal problems. Um, Sometimes you might want to prevent students from using things, like you might want to prevent a student from using a, or the built-in Python dictionary, for example. So going back to the earlier data storage program, that long interactive program, part of that exercise was to actually get students to implement a subset of the Python dictionary class itself. But I didn't want students to just wrap the dictionary class and hide it in their own little implementation. I wanted them to try and uh, apply concepts that they'd been learnt, they'd taught in, been learnt, sorry, they'd learnt in class um, to actually implement some of a dictionary themselves. But what I discovered was that students were actually just creating an empty dictionary as a literal and then using that as their sort of backend and hiding um, their sort of deviousness away from me. So once I discovered that, uh, I did some research into this problem, uh, and the solution that I've come up for this is to use the abstract syntax tree. Uh, and this is a little bit more scary. So just a quick uh, mention uh, the, to, to explain what the abstract syntax tree is. Uh, the Python interpreter will convert all your Python code into, the abstract syn into an abstract syntax tree format before it gets turned into bytecode. Um, so you can leverage that with Python's built-in AST uh, module to actually inspect what the student's code is doing and detect things like the creation of a literal dictionary. Um, so this is the solution that I've come up with because monkey patching is not going to work in this case uh, because it's treated somewhat differently to a function in Python. Um, so here's an example of how you might iterate over a student's class definition um, to deep drill, drill in and, or dig down and see if there is a the creation of a dictionary in there somewhere. Um, and you could put this in as a supplemental test case to say, uh, uh I've detected that you are actually cheating. You need to go back and fix that or change your code. And I think this uh, brings us to the last technique I recommend, uh, last technique before I get to the recommendations, is uh, checking for illegal imports. So if you want to stop your student from using NumPy um, or Pandas or something like that to take a shortcut, then you can use the built-in module finder library. Um, so this is um, relatively straightforward to use, but I think it's a little bit unknown. I think a lot of Python programmers out there don't know that this uh, exists. Um, so it's quite straightforward to use. You just need to create a module finder object, evaluate that, so run the script. Whatever that script is, you just refer to it by its name. Uh, and then you can go through the list of modules that were imported. And if that uh, one of them matches one of the ones that you want to ban, you can then uh, fail the student on that test case. OK. Um, on to recommendations. Before, before I get there, I, I want to point out that these are examples of starting points uh, for these sort of detection strategies. Um, I don't recommend that they are always used, and this should only be seen as a sort of a starting point for your journey in, in this sort of automatic testing space. Um, don't feel like you shouldn't do it because you don't see any val uh, value in doing this hard stuff. Even some of the easy stuff is quite important. So I don't want to. Um, I want you want you to remember the earlier easy examples that I showed you. Um, so the first uh, recommendation is think first. So this automatic testing um, procedure and detecting um, sort of irregularities in students' code or devious students is time consuming. So it may not be necessarily worth your time doing. You might think, oh, I saw Stephen's talk. Uh, I'm going to go try it out. 
but you might spend far too long doing it and not get any results, and it might not actually be applicable to your students. So you need to think about whether it's actually worthwhile. Um, there are also going to be uh, imperfections in your test cases, and these test cases tend to be a little bit of a hurdle for students. Um, students will come to you and complain and say, hey, I couldn't pass this test case, uh, and often the case with this automatic marking system is that students will see the um, feedback from the marking and say that they f see that they failed, and they won't think to look at their own code to s sort out the problem. They'll come to the teaching uh, staff first to, to try and fix their issues. So you may have to deal with students coming back to you a little bit too soon, um, and you might have to send them away and say, hey, you need to go and try again. Um, you, you've been given some information about how to fix that. So just be aware that there's a additional time complexity of students complaining at you all the time. Um, you might want to start with simple tests as well. I don't think there's any real need to start with really complicated tests. This, this is, again, ties into the time issue. You don't have to write crazy tests. You should think about what is going to bring you the most value in terms of your time and also the most benefit to your students. Um, and you can also limit yourselves. You don't have to deploy this across all of your assessment items or all of your exercise or all your homework at once. Maybe one week out of a term or a semester, you might try this out. Uh, and then slowly over time, you can uh, come back to your test cases and improve them or extend them to broader parts of your assessment strategy. The other thing is that I wouldn't recommend this for uh, everyone, everywhere, or all students. And it's not a complete replacement for sort of a human connection and feedback from a person. Um, so don't think that um, if you're, well, particularly for us, it's attractive because we have large number of students, but even still, we think that it's actually quite helpful to get feedback directly from your, the instructor, the teacher, um, person to person, rather than just having a computer yell at them that they got something wrong. Um, the other thing is that s most students will do the right thing, so the devious students are usually a small proportion of your students, um, and actually throwing these test cases at all of the students uh, can be a negative thing, so you need to, again, evaluate whether it's going to be worthwhile to do. Uh, and lastly, you may accidentally narrow the path. So often we want students to be creative and to be thinking for themselves, but sometimes these test cases make students sort of funnel down a path towards a standardised solution, which you might not want. Um, and it's not necessarily true that students have to follow a narrower path, it's just more that they feel that way or perhaps that prior examples that they've learned from lead them down that narrow path with your test cases. So just be aware that sometimes your test cases can be a little bit too strict and you need to make a trade-off between those strict test cases and your students' needs. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Do we have questions in the room? Gosh, we have many questions in the room. <laughs> Let's go. Okay, uh, great talk. My question was around, um, when these are used for assessments, do you give the students all of the test cases beforehand? Like, do you let them run all of the tests and kind of essentially know exactly what mark they're getting before they submit? Do you give them a subset or what's your go there? Uh, it varies. Um, Normally, well, the test cases are actually for us in our tutorials as well. So we have them in tutorials. Um, almost all the exercises are covered by test cases. Um, and in the assessments, for my assessments personally, I kind of run them as a bit of a test fail or you succeed or you um, don't. There's no sort of marking in between them. And then, but the trade-off with that is that I give the students quite a lot of help to get over the hurdle. I, I can say, this is going to be difficult for you. I know it's going to be difficult. I'm going to give you lots of help, and you, you, they can see the test cases straight away. As soon as I unlock the, um, the homework or the assessment, they can see it, they can try hacking against the test cases immediately. Yeah. Still a question over here, yes? Okay. I've got like three. Hopefully they're quick. <laughs> um, first of all, how is this deployed? Uh, is it like all on Repl.it? Do you have to create an API? How does this 
Oh, it's on Ed. Um, I could give you a demo afterwards, but um, yeah, if they have a system where you can uh, input information about uh, an exercise, so you give the description information, which I showed uh, was an example of a description. Here's an example of a description on the left that the student sees, mm -hmm. uh, and then on the back end as well, we can put in um, information about our marking procedure. And with Ed, they allow us to just run an arbitrary bit of code to do it to do the marking, and we just have to return the results to Ed in a uh, specific format. They give you a, uh, it's in JSON, uh, and they say you need to return your marking to the Ed system from your marking script in that format, and they do all the rest. Okay, so JSON Ed Ed is some Ed is an online uh, education platform. Okay. EdSTEM.org. EdSTEM and. Yep. The feedback that students get, it, it's entirely after the problem is submitted or is there anything ongoing while they're building it? Uh, no, so for the student's interface, basically they have two options, run, and then they can sort of interact with their own program or they can mark. And then the mark will then the marking button will run our marking code and then they will be presented with the uh, example of a feedback like these test cases here. So you've passed all the test cases. Right, so they get the feedback after they run. After, 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 yeah, after they click the mark button, yep. Okay, so you can't really run the, your regex thing in a loop and tell them, hey, you're ticking off, you've done this, and then this, and then this. Well, we can do, uh, in our marking code, we can do anything we want. We can run the test cases multiple times if we wanted to. Like, we can reevaluate the student's code. Each of those test cases you should think of as like, uh, so the test case 2, 107, 199, that would be uh, us running our own marking script for that test case. Uh, and we, within that, we can do whatever we like, basically. Cool. And the last question is one word answer. There was a special library for checking OO program structure that uh, I forgot the name of. Program structure? Like object oriented. Oh, well, you can, mon you can monkey patch things um, to check that uh, certain um, functions have been called as you expect as the instructor. Um, but then there's also the uh, uh, AST. AST. Yep. Thank you. Thanks very much for the presentation. I was curious to if, if you could provide more details on that narrowing of the path. Like coding is a very creative thing that really brings a lot of creativity from students. Um, and when you try to put all these blockages that could have like some negative trade-off, like sometimes brute force or hard coding things is the easy way, but sometimes hard coding or using brute force it may be more complex yeah. and maybe sh may show that the person he or she may definitely know the stuff and he just trying he or she may be trying to trick the system but at the end that's great because i mean if the person understands what they are doing well that's that's yeah. fantastic um so you mentioned that you have to manage that trade-off but what can you do to avoid the risk of penalizing someone that really knows the stuff and is just 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 trying to trick the system yeah so for me my strategy is actually outside of this automatic marking it's to offer other assessment opportunities that are more free form so this i I haven't run a unit where this is the only way we assess. I have always had other assessment items that give the students way more opportunity to express themselves and do what they like instead and meet a more, I guess, less well-defined goals. And if, as long as they meet those um, according to our marking rubric or whatever, uh, that's fine. So that, that's the opportunity for them to, to take that creative path. Okay, thank you very much. Here is your mug and your thank you card. Can <laughs> thank we give you. Stephen another round of applause? <laughs>